I'm Michael Goldman. Welcome to another installment of Studio Daily's Podcasts from the Frontline series, where each month we talk with filmmakers from various disciplines about their work on current major feature films. And this month, our guests are supervising sound editors Eric Adal and Ethan Vanderen, who recently served as co-supervising sound editors on John Krasinski's acclaimed horror thriller, A Quiet Place. The film's unique premise about human survivors of an alien invasion forced to live in silence in order to evade killer aliens that hunt entirely by their sense of hearing, made the movie a sound designer's dream, according to Vanderen, as they were forced to play with unique ways of using and enhancing silence for large stretches, among other innovations. I recently spoke with the two men about the unique project. We hope you enjoy the conversation. Thanks, guys, for joining us. Really appreciate it. Sure. Good to be here. Pleasure. And I thought first to start off, uh, just a little bit of background. Um, maybe you could sort of explain uh, the history of your partnership, how long you've been together here at your facility on the Warner lot um, called E Squared, from where you uh, previously, I guess, earned Oscar nominations for Argo and the, the last Transformers movie. The, uh, the third Transformers movie, Dark of the Moon. And that's actually how we met, was on the very, uh, well, the first time we worked together was on the very first Transformers film. Um, Ethan gave me a call one day. We'd never worked with each other and said, hey, Michael Bay just hired me to supervise Transformers. Do you want a sound design? And I said, yes. So that was uh, the beginning of a long collaboration. Uh, Since then, we've founded uh, E Squared, um, our sound company, and... uh, done all of the Transformers films and the Kung Fu Panda films and Argo and uh, Godzilla and and uh, have had a lot of creative fun. I, I think one of the f- great things about working with Ethan is uh, I think we challenge each other more creatively than any filmmaker or director has challenged us. So that's been a very um, rich and inspiring uh, <coughs> partnership for me. Yeah, and just to add to that, uh, what Eric was just saying, I think the the idea that we challenge ourselves is really, I think, what makes our partnership work as well as it as it does. Um, because for myself, I know that's always been a big part of why I've been interested in doing this work. Is you know always wanting to take on the the most challenging projects, the most challenging direct, directors, and um, you know and working with Eric, I feel like he has the the same attitude. And it's really for us, it's really all about the all about the work and not being too precious with the work, being able to you know let things go if they're not working as well as they could. And I just feel like that's that's so important to the process because it's easy uh, to fall in love with something that you've done. And one of the important uh, lessons to learn is um, to, to let things go in order to move on. Well, speaking of, uh, of challenging uh, projects, um, maybe a little background <clears throat> on the sort of the how and the why and the when, uh, you know, you guys hooked up with, with John Krasinski, the director and the star of this mm-hmm. film, mm-hmm. Uh, Quiet Place. Mm-hmm. Um, very unique project. Why that material was attractive to you guys and why it was a good fit? Uh, well, we were first approached by um, uh, the producers who we'd worked with before, and uh, they sent us a script and said, hey, read the script, and we want you to meet uh, with John Krasinski, uh, writer, director, actor. And uh, just immediately upon reading the script, we realized this is a really special project. And there were just a few lines of dialogue. So a, really a film that was all about sound. So we thought, this is thrilling. It's going to be hard as hell, but uh, it's going to be super exciting. It, um, a day or two later, we met with John, and before we could say anything, he said, this is a sound designer's dream. <laughs> so beating us to the punch. Um, and uh, we just got right into it, just started brainstorming, spitballing ideas, and a few months later, they started filming, and uh, yeah, after that, we 
started digging in and uh, making the sound. Well, uh, you, you know, I think by way of introduction of the material for people who haven't seen it yet and get ready for quite an experience uh, when you do go see it, um, you know, maybe you can contrast a little bit the uh, some of the, the primary sonic challenges that you guys, you know, were walking into uh, as compared to maybe more standard Hollywood fair, I mean, I mean, such as Transformers material, which certainly presents huge audio challenges of its own, but of a more um, large cacophony nature, I guess, than, than what we're dealing with here. And, you know, I mean, here, for, for those who, who don't know, we're in a world, we're on Earth where aliens have invaded and um, they hunt people solely by hearing them. And so everyone's got to be really, really quiet. Um, so silence, huge role and all, and all that. So, you know, what was the difference? Uh, walking into this from what you were used to walking into in some of those other pictures? Well, I would say, you know, the, the big difference really is, um, you know, it's in the title, A Quiet Place. And so one of the really big challenges uh, was how quiet can we get with this film? And so that was really sort of where the exploration began. And, you know, we just started experimenting with all the different shades of quiet. Um, everything from complete silence, you know, digital zero, which we're able to get to basically at three different um, moments, suspended moments in the film. So everything from complete silence up to actually pretty powerful, um, strong sonic moments and every gradation in between. And, you know, it's just so, so thrilling to be able to sort of um, do that kind of experimentation with all these subtle variations between different, you know, levels of quiet, which is something that obviously we play with in all our work. But this was this was a playground like no other because of the fact that the narrative of the movie really revolves around sound and quiet. And um, as you already mentioned, the idea of really being able to play with with um, silence as a narrative plot device became sort of key for for the work as we got into it. And just to add to that, you know, um, <clears throat> this really was an exercise of subtraction, <laughs> you know, a typical film is wall to wall sound, wall to wall music. And um, of course, there is music in this film, a beautiful score by Marco Beltrami, but it's very sparse. And there's places where in order to tell this story, we had to actually take out music so it would make more sense. One example is, um, you know, we have a, a main character, the daughter uh, named Regan, uh, who's deaf. And she's played by Millicent Simmons, who in real life is deaf as well. And one of the kind of early experiments we tried, and it stuck because it was so effective, was sonically getting into her point of view, her perspective. And John Krasinski wound up calling this her sonic envelope. And uh, we had to take out music um, in order for that to read because it's so easy to kind of bulldoze wallpaper through it and it loses its meaning. But um, when uh, she's wearing a cochlear implant and uh, Millicent uh, described to John what that experience is like, what that sounds like. And it's kind of like a low hum, a sort of gentle rumble. And we then interpreted that through our own experiences um, with anechoic chambers, which are completely isolated sound chambers where there's no sound that can permeate the walls or even radio frequencies. And it's actually kind of a unsettling experience. I think uh, people kind of forget that uh, the hearing is so necessary to orientation and balance. And because it's just always there, you just get so used to it. It's this comfort blanket. And when that blanket's ripped away and you don't have any sounds coming at you or the sounds that you make are not being reflected back at you, you actually can lose your balance and fall over in these anechoic chambers. And after a few minutes, um, your brain kind of readjusts and you start to hear the sounds of your own body, which is this low kind of rumble. So that was kind of our point of reference for creating her, Regan's, deaf point of view through her cochlear implant. Um, but for that to read, 
we had to kind of create contrast between what was coming in and out of it as well. So we had to make sure our airs and atmospheres, the winds through the trees, were loud enough to register a shift when we went into her, into her shoes. But um, that was one of kind of my favorite concepts from the film, creating these sonic points of view. And we do it with the creatures as well. We do it with the family as well in different ways. Um, but uh, that, to me, is part of the magic of sound, that you can put an audience in the shoes of these characters and make it even more of an immersive experience. And certainly on this film, I feel like you know, our goal was to make the audience active participants in the film. Yeah, and I want to uh, dig deeper into some of that stuff about the sonic envelope and her point of view and, and also the use of music and a few other things. Um, but I want to make sure I understand first... Uh, as you dived into this project, you know the process of uh, of designing these sounds um, was that a, a communal group effort. You guys and others, and and, and John, um, your credit as, co as as sound supervising sound editors. Mm -hmm. um, so you know maybe you could explain how you know the process and the team that, that designed this approach. You know how, how that process worked for you guys and, and mm -hmm. who all was involved with that. Yeah, so um, we had a small team um, on this movie. Our lead uh, sound designer, who actually um, has a co-supervising credit with us, is uh, someone named uh, Brandon Jones. He's been working with us for the last couple years, and um, he did a lot of uh, design work on the movie. We, uh, Eric and I um, sat down initially with an early cut of the movie and went through it, uh, just the two of us, and started focusing on some of the key moments um, to try and work out a couple of key concepts. The first being uh, this idea of a sonic uh, envelope for, for Regan. And that's something that we discussed with John Krasinski initially. We had an initial um, meeting with uh, John when we started working on the movie and just sort of had a general kind of brainstorming session about um, interesting things to try with the sound design. One of the, one of the main sort of topics of that conversation had to do with the creature sound design and what they should sound like. And I, I feel like that was sort of the main, the main idea of that conversation, that and, and probably the idea of just being able to really get the world quiet enough so that as an audience, we would believe in it and we establish a sort of logic to the world in terms of, you know, um, animals, for instance. There are no kind of loud animals left anymore, with the idea being they would be, they, you know, they've already been uh, attacked and and killed so that, that was sort of the main thrust of that com er, uh, initial conversation with john along with the creature sound design and then john actually said to us should we, should i come to your studio and should we spot the film you know and we said no actually what we'd like to do is just sit with you know work with the film ourselves for a little bit and, you know, just let it all percolate. And so Eric and I came back to our studio and just s sat down. And the first thing we started working on was the opening of the movie um, through the, the first attack at the, at the bridge. And in that session, we were able to explore the idea of creating this sonic envelope for Regan, the daughter who is deaf. And we're also able to start playing with what this creature is going to sound like. And we're also able to start to establish the sonic rules for the for the world that all this is taking place in. And then we did that initial pass. We sent it through to uh, to John to the picture editing uh, where the picture editing was taking place, and to the producers who were in Los Angeles. And so we were able to just basically bounce down a quick time mix of that sort of initial sketch pass we had done and get feedback. And then we went straight into working on one of the, the uh, another big key concepts uh, in the film, which really plays out through the sound design, which is th this whole idea that Regan's cochlear implant is interfering with the creature in some uh, negative way and causing the creature uh, excruciating pain and also causing feedback for, for Regan. 
that uh, you know she experiences in a painful way. And so there's a, a scene early in the movie in the cornfield where Regan's alone in the cornfield and the creature emerges um, out of the cornfield behind her. And of course, the creature is blind. So even though it's only 10 feet from her, it doesn't know that she's there. But because of this interference with the hearing aid, it starts to experience this pain. And then Regan starts to experience the feedback and pain from that. And so um, basically the the challenge there was like, okay, we know we want to go into her sonic envelope that we've already sort of established earlier and then start to experience the feedback with her. And then we also want to go into this creature's, create a, a sonic envelope for the creature and basically describe sonically how this creature experiences the world with this hyper acute hearing. And then we want that to sort of morph into this excruciatingly painful uh, electronic interference with the cochlear implant. And so we started on working that on that scene. um, And at that point, there was no actual creature in that scene. It was just a blank plate. But we started experimenting with the sound design anyways. And we felt like um, we got something that we felt was really working in an interesting and dynamic way. And again, we sort of uh, did a little mix on it, stereo mix, and sent that through to all the different sort of collaborators on the movie. And that's sort of how we proceeded through the film, sort of prioritizing the key concepts that we wanted to attack first and doing little sketch passes to try and work out the concept and then sending it through, getting feedback, and just attacking it that way. And one of the other cool parts of the collaboration is um, uh, this one was kind of rare in the sense of how much sound affected the picture editing and affected the visual effect. You know, typically sound might be just something tacked on to the end of the process, Um, But this was really an example of evolving the sound along with the picture and with the visual effects. So in the cornfield example, it was kind of the logic of the sound that really dictated how the scene was going to be cut. And uh, then once we kind of had the architecture of that put together, um, there were other realizations. Like um, we started to get VFX in from ILM in particular where we start really pushing in on the creature and its ears open up and we realized we needed just more time on that shot. We needed a few more seconds of head on the shot so we could establish the cornfield sounds, the insects in the cornfield, and then as the ear opens up, then be able to register the going into the envelope of this creature's point of view so all of those insect sounds come way up to a giant level and then within the same shot, be able to then twist into the hearing aid interference. So um, that was kind of cool where we could say, hey, we need a few more seconds from ILM to, to be able to tell all of those beats clearly, and uh, which is kind of a special and rare thing. When you guys um, were developing all this and, and you're working uh, with the director uh, and this young lady, um, Millicent Simmons, the actress who, who, who as you said, in, in real life uh, is deaf and, and does wear a cochlear implant. What was the process for, for her getting, uh, teaching you guys that and, and any other research you did? What it's like to wear a cochlear implant for a person who, who has hearing, it must be very difficult to comprehend. I mean, it's one thing to cover your ears for a second, but that's not really what it's all about. And the fact that she can feel certain things. I'm not an expert, but I understand that the implant um, basically bypasses the damaged part of the ear and, 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 and tries to send sensation to the part that were. But it's not like full hearing. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, to get that understanding so that it would be realistic, um, even though the people who would know if it's realistic are people who can't hear it. You know? Yeah, and, yeah, and tell yeah. us if we got it right or not. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I mean, all of, all of that work that we did is based on John um, basically describing uh, Millicent's description of her experience to him. So, you know, her and her mother described it, uh, her experience directly to John, and then John, you know, basically described it that to us and that's that's really what we based it all on and then you mentioned uh 
this issue of the sonic envelopes, and, and it's most prominent with her. Uh, the creatures ha have them. Do, do any other characters? I, I know there was a scene uh, where uh, the two parents, mm -hmm. um, uh, j you know, played by John and Emily Blunt, mm -hmm. want to have a romantic moment to themselves mm -hmm. in, in this world that's been turned upside down for them, and and they they listen on, on earbuds to, to Neil Young's beautiful song uh, "Harvest Moon." Um, and it, you know, one minute it's not there, and then it's there while earbuds are in are, are in their ears. You know, sort of designing and editing that so that it, it wasn't like we're just kicking back and listening to a Neil Young tune. It's mm -hmm. part of the narrative. There's a dramatic reason. Yeah, no, and and and, and that was not our idea. That was purely John Krasinski's um, great filmmaking. Uh, no, that was actually in the script. You know, he yeah. had he had written that that song specifically into the script and i know um you know originally they thought it was going to be much too expensive um mm -hmm. <laughs> to be able to afford it for the film because the budget was uh relatively low for this the movie to be able to afford a song like that but um but i know that it was important to john to have that song specifically so so he was able to to make it happen because it was that you know important to him you know um there's there's a couple of other um, sonic envelopes that we create, um, but I would say the, the main other sonic envelope has to do with basically the envelope of the, the hearing characters in the film, which, of course, as an audience, is the envelope that we share with them through much of the experience. And I think that's part of why uh, we've gotten a lot of feedback on this film, uh, how interactive an experience it is for an audience to, um, to experience it, because it, it really, by creating this envelope that, that uh, basically works for the audience, as well as the hearing characters in the movie, uh, it really sucks us in to the experience. So uh, this film is very much about all these different sonic envelopes that we're able to create for the for the various characters, including the audience. Yeah, and in a typical uh, motion picture, of course, dialogue is a big deal. And in an ironic way, it is here, too, because there is, in fact, dialogue. But it's all about when and how can you get away with speaking without summoning the, the creatures, you know, a, a little bit in the bunker underground, but, but also that they train themselves or learned, you know, you can go to a place with a much larger sound and talk under it. So then you are, after all, editors, among other things, you know, balancing when, when uh, the father takes the son to the waterfall to teach him, this is a place mm -hmm. we can talk, um, because the pounding of the water drowns us out, uh, you know, how you layered that so we could hear their conversation but make it clear that it's supposed to be drowned out by the waterfall. It seems to me it would be a lot of uh, very complicated stuff in Pro Tools. Well, it's um, it's a real delicate kind of thing. You know, you can overshoot it. Obviously, we want people to understand the dialogue, but you don't want it to be so clear so that you ruin the logic that um, this waterfall is masking it. You know, it's a, that whole sequence is really a demonstration of masking and in sound that's essentially as it's described in the movie a louder sound will drown out a smaller sound so they are able to to speak in this environment it's uh we went through many many different delicate iterations and that that was less editing i think it was more on the mix stage where we got those balances and uh, we're also intercutting with their conversation to much quieter environments with following Emily's um, story as well. So the intercutting also affects, you know, how do you then pop back into the waterfall? And actually through that sequence, it's we're getting more and more emotional because the conversation father and son is having is about how um, Mil uh, Millicent's character, Regan, is kind of estranged and doesn't know, doesn't really feel dad's love. Um, so the arc of that whole sequence is kind of taking the waterfall and just subliminally lowering it and br slowly introducing music. So there's kind of a rack focus from, sonically a rack focus, from the reality of this experience to the emotional reality. And we, we, we mentioned earlier, um, uh, you know, the, the unusual use of music uh, by 
having it, but then taking it away mm -hmm. uh, and not overdoing it and, and being very strategic ab about it. And, 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 you know, I mean, this is, I, I think we talked when I came in, some people consider this a horror movie, some people consider it a, uh, a thriller, but, but certainly you do maintain, you know, that concept of, of, of sort of the jump scare, you know, uh, for, you know, for sudden sound, particularly when every, you know darn well everyone's life depends on being quiet. You know, the, sort of those strategic moments, knowing when to <coughs> bang you. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I was impressed because it was all directly related to the narrative. It was, never was gratuitous. But, you know, some of the challenges you had there of when to do a classical horror movie mm -hmm. noise that we're mm -hmm. definitely not expecting mm -hmm. and don't want to hear at that mm -hmm. time. Well, you know, one example of that is in the very opening of the film. The family's in the pharmacy um, scavenging for medication, and, um, and the youngest son... Um, is trying to grab hold of this toy, this space shuttle toy up on a shelf. And it kind of slips off the shelf, and his older sister rushes in to catch it. Um, there was an iteration of that that had a big music sting on it, which is conventional. You know, normally the process is you kind of overscore, and then just so you have it all to play with um, during the mix. And um, that was a place where there was a sting that was put in. And, um, you know, John, everybody thought, you know, why? What's the point? We're, <laughs> we're actually subverting the logic of the film here. So um, that was an example where uh, we stripped out a sting. And, uh, but like you said, there are other places where there are some little shock moments. But we felt that we had to earn those. You know, the use of music is interesting um, in, in film in general today because I think as it's a little bit a uh, victim of the process of the way the films, films come together these days, which is that, uh, you know, in the editing process, which obviously starts very early, usually when the film's still being shot, um, the editors, the picture editors usually don't have much sound design to work with. And so as a consequence of that, they start putting in music in order to drive scenes. And it was interesting because when we first when we saw the first the first cut of this movie, um, there was a lot of music throughout it. And we said to each other, you know, if there was ever a movie that really uh, should work uh, in a different way, this would be it in the sense that. You know, really, we should start doing our work before any music has been put in and work from the sound up and figure out, you know, where the sound design really drives and supports the narrative and where um, it feels like we could use music. So as we started doing our work, we sort of quickly realized that um, some of these key scenes that, I, that I've already described that we started working on, the opening of the movie through the, through the bridge attack and this cornfield scene, the sound design was so important to basically driving the narrative that we, we just um, took the music out that was there because there was temp music pretty much throughout. And we took it out and said, we're just going to do our work and then figure out where we need to reintroduce music. And I think that was a, sort of the, the process for this movie in general. And it's just, it's interesting. Sometimes we just wish that, you know, we were able to start our work much earlier in the process so that there was never the need to introduce temp music so early in the process in order to, to get the film standing on its feet. Because in a way, that's sort of taking steps forward that we then have to backtrack on later in the process. So it's just, um, it's an interesting way that movies tend to come together these days. Well, and on that point, on the other side of the coin, um, small, tiny, little stuff that might appear in all films, but we almost never notice it because it has no dramatic purpose other than to try to have a semblance of, of you know, the real world or whatever. But, you know, the walking on gravel, the snap of a twig, a dripping of water, some, some uh, you know, tearing of fabric or, or heavy breathing um, when you hurt yourself and you can't wail or whatever. It was so strategically used and impressive. Uh, and, and I guess it also illustrates uh, in this digital era the art of the folia is, is not dead by any, any <laughs> means. You know, with some of the things where so we could see, I mean, it's impossible to make no noise if you're moving and there's 
debris and things around, you know, how you manage that and decide, well, here's enough that it's okay, but we mm -hmm. can't have it go here because then the creatures would hear it. You know, mm -hmm. I right. figure that out. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, a lot of it's just experimentation. And, you know, every sound affects every other sound. So, for example, a footstep um, might be way too loud, isolated, and on its own. Um, but if you introduce the atmospheres and the wind through the trees, those can kind of cloak that sound. But the, in other scenes, we're down in the basement, which is padded and completely sound isolated. So there's actually no airs, no room tones, no hums, no anything. So that same footstep is going to sound giant in there. So everything is relative and affects everything else. So that's very much what we experimented with through the whole process. Um, uh, certain things like the family walking um, to the trestle bridge in the beginning of the film, we didn't play Foley at all on the wide shots because um, that defeated our logic. We just played the airs and the winds. And then you really only hear the footstep when we cut into a close up. So perspective was also a really interesting uh, key concept for us. things weren't complicated enough mom is a baby um, <laughs> and babies are not by nature meant to be silent um, uh, certainly mine weren't what was the fine line walk there where obviously the threat of the baby making noise that could summon death for everyone uh, is an issue and yet you don't want to be hackneyed and, and, and just have the baby wailing all the time and it seemed like um, there wasn't a, a dramatic line drawn there where the baby could be comforted enough, even by people who were scared out of their minds, to calm down. So how, what was the deal about how much baby to throw in there, when mm -hmm. to do it, and when mm -hmm. not to do it? Mm -hmm. You know, fortunately, the structure of the film kind of helped us with some of the baby issues. Like when we go in what we call the red room, after um, mom sets the visual alarm uh, with all the red lights light up, and she's she's down below with the baby and the whole basement has flooded by its very structure of that scene it helped us with that logic of can the baby make any noise or no noise because there's water rushing and that sound is cloaking masking the sound of the baby so that the creature is not just going to instantly take them out but there were some debates like you know the family has uh was very clever in creating this little uh box for the baby with a little oxygen mask and uh we debated you know when you first reveal that and um you know they put the uh put the little oxygen mask <clears throat> muzzle on the baby and close the baby in we debated do we take out all of the baby sounds when the thing gets muffled uh do we just have a little bit of sound emanating through the wood of the lid of that box and uh we did one early test screening, and um, the audience, we had taken out all the sound of the baby on that shot when the lid goes on, and there was this chuckle in the audience. And the filmmakers were, got a little concerned, like, was that a release of pent-up, you know, angst energy? Was that a nervous chuckle, or was it actually a funny moment? Um, so there's so much debate and experimentation back and forth and where we wound up um, in, in the scene was we had just the faintest little hint of muffled baby vocal on there. Um, there was another scene where uh, baby's born and it's the first full conversation um, between husband and wife down in the basement and we had one little off-screen baby peep and uh, that also got a little chuckle mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> they actually recut the scene just a little bit in order to uh, for it to play right it's interesting because I think what really what we're we're sort of 
talking about is the sonic, you know, logic of the film in terms of, oh, you know, uh, what's too loud that breaks the logic of the film. And there's something so powerful about setting up this structure, this sonic logic, and then really sticking to it. Um, you know, and despite, you know, there's there's many times throughout the film where it, be, where it would be tempting to break the logic for dramatic reasons. And, but there's something so powerful about staying true to the logic. So you're constantly reinforcing it so that we can really as an audience, we really buy into the world and buy into the experience because, you know, we really tried hard to create this this logic and then live by it in a way. And I, th I think that's important to to the film working as well as it does. Speaking of, of signaling noises, you know, the, the creatures themselves have their own very unique sound, a kind of a clicking sort of a thing. Um, and I th I, as I watched the movie, I realized, well, there's a bit of a dichotomy here. One of the reasons people know to shut the hell up is when they hear this clicking. Mm -hmm. So the humans are hearing them as well. Mm -hmm. and, and it's one of the key aspects of how you can try to protect yourself. What was the design or, or the figuring out of, uh, of what the alien should sound like? Well, the aliens, you know, um, they're blind. So they, they don't have sight. So their entire perception their, uh, of the universe is through sound. And, um, and of course, they're they move very elegantly and swiftly. They're not bumping into things. So somehow they're able to create a 3D map of, of their universe. So um, it just made sense that uh, they would use sound to orient themselves. And so echolocation became kind of the, our starting point for, uh, for how they use sound. And, uh, and of course, there's certain creatures in the real world that use echolocation, like uh, dolphins and beluga whales and bats, and which are these little clicking sounds that um, they're higher frequency clicking sounds that they ping out and they reflect off of the 3D environment and, and then the creatures hear them and they can basically have like a three-dimensional geographic map of their environment. Some humans, some blind people use that as well, either with a cane or doing mouth clicks, and they can get a very accurate, they can see, oh, there's a tree six feet away. So yeah, that was kind of the starting point for their searching mode of these creatures. One other thing, um, you mentioned earlier, this film is a bit different in terms of working with a picture editor, and, and, and this film was cut by Christopher Tellison, mm -hmm. um, you know, well-known editor. Um, uh, what was the collaborative process with him and, and John like in terms of, you know, okay, we can create all the sounds you want and all, all the effects you want, you know, whatever, but in terms of us all being on the same page about the length, the, the volume, the pitch, the combinations, um, you know, when to drop it and go silent. You know, how, how did that work? You know, how close uh, a relationship did you, did you have to have with, with, with Chris for, for cutting this movie? Well, we were in L.A. and Christopher was in New York. <laughs> yeah, so there, <laughs> there was an interesting because, um, be, because of that factor, it forced the interaction to all, all be on a remote kind of level. And essentially the way it worked is um, what we've sort of already described a little bit in the sense that we here uh, in L.A., we would do a pass on a scene and make it basically uh, the way that we felt it should be. And then we would send it through to everyone, including Chris, um, at the picture department, uh, to get feedback. And we would get feedback and make adjustments. And um, conversely, um, there were times when we felt the the picture edit needed to change a little bit to make things work better in terms of telling the story and specifically uh, telling the sonic story. And so we would be able to relay that information. Fortunately, um, in a lot of those moments, we had either John with us, so it was uh, quick to make those calls, or we had um, Andrew Form, one of the producers, with us for quite a bit of this process. And he was able to, to phone some of these picture editing notes straight into John, who could make it happen quickly. Um, so in some ways, the back and forth 
happened much quicker than it does on a lot of projects because um, it was a slightly condensed schedule and things had to happen quickly. We really had to, to pull it together quickly. And fortunately, for a lot of the these key moments, uh, we either had John with us or Andrew Form with us. You know, we consider the sound design to be, you know, a 50% of the experience. And so... <laughs> It, uh, if you believe that to be true, then it makes sense that you really need the sound design earlier than by, you know, the, by the time you hit the mixing stage. So that's part of our philosophy about getting the sound design into the Avid as early as possible so that uh, the picture editing, the visual effects, everything can be developing, co-evolving essentially together. And uh, especially in a film like this, where so much of the narrative really is dependent on the sound design, that that was key. Well, as we, we wrap up here, you know, talking about the technical stuff, you know, what was the basic uh, platform and infrastructure and workflow for this? I mean, I, I guess I assume it's Pro Tools, but, mm -hmm. you know, the, am, am I correct that the innovation in this movie is the creative innovation uh, that, that's pretty standard? you know, what you used to do it, or, or were there some areas um, where, the, where, where there was a bit of a cutting edge done here? Well, you know, for us, um, the tools we use should become kind of invisible. And uh, and the, it's the product that's created is, is the important thing. But, um, of course, the tools are important. <laughs> so, yes, we do work on Pro Tools. Um, we're set up on uh, a server that we've built here, so we can shut a session down um, in one room, open it up in another design room two seconds later, close that session down, open it up on the mixing stage, all running off of the same server. Um, so it's very fluid um, sort of platform that we work on. And then in terms of the tools, I'd say some of the some of the more interesting things for me, just uh, tool-wise, might be some of the ways we mic'd certain things. Um, right behind you here is our buddy Fritz. That's a Neumann KU100, and that's a microphone. It's in the shape of a human head, but um, it's a binaural microphone. The entire head is a microphone? The entire head is a microphone. Folks, you should be here to see that. <laughs> <laughs> so if you pull, it's, he's got headphones on right now. If you pull those off, you can see he's got ears. So the shape of that ear uh, can create the effect of something being behind you, being on your head. And uh, there's scenes in the film where the father is scanning, you know, through shortwave radio, trying to see if there's any other survivors in the world. When he puts his headphones on, you're, you go into his sonic envelope and you hear the headphones go whoop onto his ears. So that was actual headphones on actual ears to, to make that sound. Same thing with um, Regan, the daughter. When she pulls her cochlear implant out, there's this thump kind of sound. Uh, that was done with that type of microphone as well. You, you guys must both be really proud of this work. I'm sure everyone is. You know, what do you both take away from this project as you move on to your next uh, individually and as a team um, mm -hmm. you know, that will make you better sound editors, better mm -hmm. filmmakers? Mm -hmm. Negative space. Maybe. Yeah, no, I mean, I think <laughs> the, one of the big things is really it's reinforced. This, this, the, the way that this, this film has resonated with, with audiences, I think, has reinforced a lot of our instincts about how we – how we do our work in terms of creating negative space in the track, in terms of um, being able to really strip down, simplify, play things, play scenes uh, without music. And this can be powerful and, and maybe at times more powerful than playing it a more conventional way. And, you know, our instincts a lot of times are to go in this direction. And um, I think the, the fact that this movie has resonated the way it has just reinforces some of those instincts for us. Well, it's certainly, uh, you know, it was an impressive effort. And, um, you know, both you guys, uh, Eric and Ethan, I want to thank you for taking time to join us. And we really appreciate it. And best of luck with it. Thank you so Thanks much. so much. It was a pleasure. And that was another Studio Daily podcast from the front lines. My conversation with co-supervising sound editors Eric Adol and Ethan Vanderen about their work on John Krasinski's new film, A Quiet Place. We hope you enjoyed it. Watch your inbox every month for more newsletters directing you to our monthly podcasts covering the art, science, and people involved in the world of feature filmmaking. 
I'm Michael Goldman. Have a great day.